Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Jacob D. Mandel Lectures. I'm Kenny Wallman, and along with my colleague, Jesse Hofer, I have the privilege of organizing this lecture series. This year's lectures are entitled Early Anabaptists on Gewalt, Gelassenheit, and Ordnung, delivered by Jonathan Staling. In Tyrol and Moravia, during the 1530s, early Anabaptists were forced to reflect theologically on how Christians should respond to violent persecution. Was violence permitted by God in any circumstance? What does the Bible say about God's ordained authorities using the sword? Initially, Anabaptists explored a diverse range of ethical options, many of which contrasted sharply with both Catholic and Protestant views on these matters. This series will consider the two decades between 1526 and 1545 and contrast ideas on the sword held by Anabaptist writers and clarify their rather unique Anabaptist positions on nonviolence and their relationship to the governing authorities. For tonight's lecture, the key word chosen is Gewalt. And this lecture will bring Clemens Adler from Jakob Wiedemann's Stäbler Group in conversation with Wolfgang Brandhuber, Hans Huth, and Balthasar Hubmeier, looking at the concept of the spirit and the word, how the Bible offers conflicting views on violence, and how Huth, Hubmeier, and Adler suggested conflicting biblical passages could be interpreted. Does God ordain the sword for use by the pagan government while forbidding it for the elect? In an era of horrific persecution, how could this view be justified? Given this is the first of the three lectures, I want to say a few words about the history and the vision of this lecture series. From 2018 to 2020, Hutterites in Manitoba commemorated the centennial of permanent Hutterite settlement in the province of Manitoba. The Jacob D. Mandel Lecture Series was conceived by an ad hoc task force at that time, and this is the fourth installment. The purpose of these lectures is to stimulate learning and invite discussion about topics of interest both within the Hutterite community and the academic world of Hutterite Anabaptist studies. It's our hope to bring the academic fields of history, theology, and literature into the service of the church. The lectures attempt to cultivate something of Jacob D. Mandel's vision for the church. As we understand it, this vision includes a deep appreciation for Hutterite history and the broader Christian tradition, an open-mindedness to non-Hutterites and new ideas, a reverence for creation, and a boldness in putting convictions into action. You can read a more detailed biography of Jacob Mandel at jdmlectures.org. Before introducing our speaker, for tonight and outlining the format of today's lecture, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather to learn about how early Anabaptists wrestled with scripture and attempted to be faithful to God. Please be with us this evening. Give us clear and discerning minds to understand the lecture. We especially pray that you bless Jonathan as he communicates the findings of his research for our benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. So about the format. The format of this and the subsequent lectures will be very simple. For the first 45 minutes to an hour, Jonathan will lecture and then there will be an opportunity for questions and response. Tonight, Jesse Hofer will moderate them, and you should be able to ask questions via the chat window, or if things go well, even ask them directly uh, by unmuting yourself. We'll see how it goes. 
Before uh, handing it over to Jonathan, let me uh, say a few words about him. Jonathan Sailing is a historian and translator of early Anabaptism and their literature. As an undergraduate student, he first became interested in Anabaptist studies through courses with Van Opakul. He has collaborated with several scholars on major translation projects and is the publisher at Gelassenheit Publications, which was established in 2012. In partnership with Emmy Bart Mendel, he is preparing a translation of Jacob Hutter's writings and a collection of documents surrounding his life and ministry. This will be published in the Classics of the Radical Reformation series by Plough Publishing alongside books like Riedemann's Confession of Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, please join me in giving Jonathan Sailing a very warm welcome as he delivers the 2022 Jacob D. Mandel Lectures. Jonathan, over to you. Thanks very much, Kenny, for that uh, warm introduction. And uh, also, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, this really is an honor. And uh, to each one of you who has taken the time this evening to attend, uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, this, it, it's, it would be lovely if I could come in person and, and actually uh, experience a face-to-face -face dialogue. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm simply grateful that we at least have this version of a dialogue. So um, I, I have a bit of a strange uh, format for the screen share, and I hope it isn't disturbing to anybody, but uh, this is the only way my computer allows me to do it. So I am now... Uh, sharing the slides, which, um, which primarily will give you uh, some quotes. So as I, as I go through topics uh, and, and address various uh, writers and, and the writings, um, I, I'm giving you the, the texts in this document. Um, so uh, many studies have been undertaken on the topic of non-resistance in Anabaptism. And while I will draw upon these, I will mostly try to focus on the key figures, contexts, and the writings from which we can see the formation of a tradition of non-resistance um, in, in these two decades. Um, and in this way, I hope these lectures will serve a more practical purpose, um, orienting some of you to texts you uh, may not have encountered yet, uh, as a few of them that I'll use are not yet even published in German, uh, let alone translated into English. Um, some of them will be quite familiar to some of you who have stu studied early Anabaptism. Uh, I want to apologize also briefly for the title, Gewalt, um, Gelassenheit, Ordnung. This may give people the impression that a lot of the, that, that you need to know German in order to grasp the lecture. That's not the case. So I hope this didn't scare anybody away. Uh, but simply these three terms, uh, I believe are so central to understanding uh, and, and actually the way, uh, the, the difficulty in translating them directly into English with a single word. Um, it, it led me to choose these um, as sort of an overall theme and to develop the theme as Lecture one, Gewalt, lecture two, Gelassenheit, lecture three, Ordnung. But in fact, all three of these terms um, e express some of the debate internal to Anabaptism, uh, which all unfold. The period of these two decades um, includes what I'll call a pre Hutterite tradition. Um, and although I have worked on this edition of, of Jacob Hutter's writings, um, uh, I will only look briefly at Hutter um, uh, tomorrow morning's lecture. Uh, the primary concerns Hutter addressed were to comfort the faithful. And in his role as bishop or forsteher, uh, he addressed leadership controversies. That really was uh, his profound contribution to the tradition. Some of the challenges he dealt with uh, were only indirectly related to matters of non-resistance and the relationship to government. Um, and so the lack of clarity on certain issues related to the position on the sword or obedience to government, um, I think played only a minor role in 
in the early leadership issues that, that he particularly addressed in Moravia, in my view. However, the texts that attest most clearly to the positions on the sword and non-resistance come from various other voices, some of whom we hear very little about in the chronicle of the Maturian Brethren. And, and as, as mentioned by Kenny, um, the two scholars to whom I owe the most debt for their work, uh, in addition to Werner Packel, um, uh, is uh, Martin Rothkegel uh, in Berlin, my good friend and colleague who has been very helpful in sharing sources with me that are also not yet available um, outside of archives, uh, and also for his ongoing leadership uh, as a researcher in this field. Of course, there are a great number of other colleagues I could mention whose work I've drawn upon, but especially James Steyer. Um, but, but rather than discuss scholars of our day, I'll, I'll focus back on the primary materials. As you may assume, in the early Reformation, there is not a clear agreement on the nature of a Christian's relationship to government, or the sword, as they often put it, neither among Catholics nor among Protestants, and certainly not among Anabaptists, except for the revolutionaries. Um, most writers accepted that the sword was ordained for the use by, uh, by the state. Could a Christian be involved in that? That was the main issue that they would uh, divide over. Over the, the last 15 years or so of, of my scholarship, I've carried out a project of collecting, translating, and comparing quite a wide range of Christian sources, Catholic, Protestant, all, um, on the topic of nonviolence non or, or resistance um, in the period up till about 1540, with a special focus on the Anabaptist and, and also spiritualist traditions. It began with a request from a professor of mine, Arnold Snyder at Conrad Gravel, where I studied, to translate a treatise by Clemens Adler on the sword. And to this point, uh, I, I've translated and begun editing a collection of over 50 writings, uh, from which I selected about 10 um, that I believe are most relevant to the early Hutterite church. These include anti-Hutterite writings, I, I could call them, um, and also what you could call proto-Hutterite, um, a, a term I think originated with uh, Werner Packel, uh, which I use to generally mean those that uh, arose before Hutter, uh, but were in alignment with him. By comparing and categorizing these writings and the positions they present, I've tried to create um, a systematic schema to delineate uh, which exact issues these texts deal with. Um, and I won't present this schema in detail, um, but I will plan to provide an outline of this in a written version of these lectures. Uh, through the long process of sorting and comparing, I've learned that when I read someone who addresses one particular issue related to violence, it is best not to assume what that person thinks on the rest of the range of issues related to violence or the sword, um, or, or the payment of taxes, um, or how they believe the Bible as a whole should be used in addressing any question. People seem to be able to justify violence in one case, but adamantly oppose it in another while using scripture. Um, so their use of arguments from the Bible also implies something about their understanding of how the Bible as a whole is to be understood. We see that the word of God in written form is brought to the defense of different positions, even opposing ones, and instead of noting that one or the other argument is based on scripture, we should ask, what is the scriptural approach being used here? How is the word which is made manifest in actual words on a page, compared to the spirit, God's intent or, or fuller purpose, which we experience in ways that go beyond the words on the page. The spirit is this unified force or power from God and the word clarifies or expresses the spirit in many ways when we use human words. Um, and we sometimes find confusion and contradiction rather than unity. This is partly the story of the Tower of Babel, but it's also the reality that the Bible itself speaks in many words in which we see different, even conflicting guidance from God. 
Nowhere is this made clearer than the question of violence, the sword, or the use of force by humans. We'll explore this issue directly here, especially in reference to Balthazar Hubmeier and Clemens Adler. But just in general, another word, a major goal of mine in this three lecture series is to provide this range of diverse examples from the three periods in the context where Moravian Anabaptism and the Hutterite Church was born. Uh, and these will allow us to discuss the degree to which we find them convincing today. By, and uh, one outstanding text and figure we'll look at today is The Judgment on the Sword by Clemens Adler from 1529, um, which is the year in which Hutter was called to ministry. I just realized I, I skipped over this um, page of questions. I, I'm going to keep going. Um, we'll, we'll move on to, to Hutter. Uh, this outlines very briefly. Uh, the four, um, in, four, four individuals uh, and the years in which uh, they deceased, um, Hans Hutt, Balthasar Hubmeier, Wolfgang Brandhuber, Clemens Adler. Uh, before I move to to Hutt. Uh, Adler's Treaties is a well-structured writing of great clarity and it presents an argument against the university trained theologian Balthazar Hubmeier, whose position we'll also consider today. Hubmeier, like others, argues that a Christian can and must in fact take up the sword in certain cases in obedience to God. In addition to contrasting Hubmeier and Adler, I'll also look more briefly at the key figures of Hans Hutt and Balthazar Hubmeier both of whom are critical for understanding the proto hutterite tradition in the late 1520s. We begin now with Hans Hutt, who famously took over the mantle of uh, Thomas Münzer, the revolutionary and apocalyptic leader who inspired many peasants to rise up in 1524-25, resulting in a devastating defeat. Hubmeier was also key uh, as a leader in one region of the revolts and many other future Anabaptists carried with them the lessons they personally learned about revolution and their relationship to the sword and government. Increasingly, these dissenters were both introduced to and convinced of the idea of rebaptism and the spiritual rebirth, the divine power that accompanied the new movement's rejection of the Roman Catholic traditional membership in the body of Christ. Hans Hutt, played a foundational role in the rise of this baptizing movement in Southern Germany and Austria. And while we can't examine his role in the rise of the movement and its spread in detail, uh, this has been done sufficiently by um, uh, James Steyer and Anna Paco, uh, we should note that Hood's contagious excitement for the end times and the return of Christ pervaded his message of repentance and spiritual renewal and the urgency of accepting adult baptism upon confession of faith before the return of Christ. And while Hutt had cheered on the violent peasant revolts, he himself admonished new Anabaptisms after the failed revolts um, to expect God's wrath to fall upon evildoers and to find one's place among the innocent elect of Christ. He added, that the sword must stay in its sheath until the second coming and the day of judgment, when the elect will be used by God to defeat the godless. Meanwhile, the Turks would become divine instruments of wrath against false Christians. To be sure, when Christ returns, the sword is to be unsheathed by righteous Christians. Interrogation proceedings recorded the following from Hood, as you see in the notes. A Christian may well have a sword, but it must remain in a sheath until God tells him to take it out. Before then, Christians would all be scattered and put to trial. Finally, the Lord would gather them all together again, and he himself would return. Then the saints would punish the others, namely the sinners who had not repented. Then the clergy who had preached falsely would have to answer for their teaching, and the mighty for their use 
of gewalt, of violence. Whoever had done well would be able to stand before God. In this way, Hood and his associates predicted calamity and the triumph of the righteous, a rather violent scene. The end would come three and a half years after the, peasant, the end of the Peasants' War, which landed Judgment Day sometime in the summer of 1528. In order that we might appreciate the reference to the Turks in these writings, we should recall during the 1520s, the advances of the Ottoman armies threatened to overrun the Eastern frontier of the Holy Roman Empire. The Habsburgs were in a panicked process of negotiation between princes and states in order to secure a combined military force which would ensure victory on the Eastern Front. Uh, by 1526, the Turks had defeated the imperial armies at Mohacs, Hungary, in which King Louis II uh, of Hungary was killed, uh, then to be replaced by Ferdinand of the Habsburg dynasty. 1529, the Ottoman armies with over 100,000 soldiers um, besieged Vienna, which was defended by less than a quarter the size of that Turkish army. That siege led to a stalemate, which uh, was about 150 years of regional tensions between the Habsburgs and the Ottomans. The internal threats of religious political disunity in Europe made the empire vulnerable indeed, which the Lutheran princes were able to exploit by insisting on religious concessions in exchange for providing military assistance to fight against the Turks. In this context, an Anabaptist who, like Hood, seemed to applaud God's use of the Turks, was in this sense possibly guilty of sedition or treason. At first, the revolutionaries hoped to overthrow their governing authorities from within in the mid 1520s. Then they hoped for the Turks to overthrow them from without. As we will see in the second lecture tomorrow as well, the notion that God's ordinance and blessing of a political authority was not seen by all as a permanent one, but conditional, based on the ruler's obedience to God. They saw God as free when ordained authorities disobey God to use their enemies to punish them. The apocalyptic expectation of the imminent end times as seen in Hutt was widespread in the non-resistant tradition, including Jacob Hutter, um, but also Wolfgang Brandt Huber and others that will be studying in this series. Notably, one exception is Balthasar Hubmeier, who rejected Hutt's message of the end times. In any case, certain other Anabaptists before and after 1528 were willing to keep the sword permanently in its sheath by insisting True Christians are never called to wield it or exact violence. They might still have maintained the world was about to end, but that would not influence whether they would change their relationship to the sword. The Schleitheim articles of February 1527 uh, in Switzerland portrayed what has come to be called the separatist vision of the church apart from society, um, a, a fellowship of the faithful which cannot mix with the world, neither as a spiritual presence nor as a physical presence in the world. The Schleitheim articles, which I will not address in depth, uh, were later affirmed in the Hutterite tradition, um, and they rejected the possibility that a Christian could be a ruler, a magistrate, um, or that the sword could have any role, quote, inside the perfection of Christ. In this same year, 1527, we see Balthazar Hubmeier's effort to articulate an opposing position on the sword. Let's now look at, at his very last publication, which came in 1527, entitled On the Sword, A Christian Explication of the Scriptures, which are often quoted earnestly by many brethren against the government, that is, that the Christian should not sit in authority nor wield the sword. So there are two questions really. One, dealing with the political ruler and 
more broadly speaking, can the sword be used at all for any lethal task? Can a Christian support that? Here, Hubmeier is attempting to publicly defend his own position and to silence those ideas he encountered in the Nicholsburg so-called Stabler or staff bears, and Hans Hut as their main leader. Hubmeier is also addressing how scripture is used by other brethren or Anabaptists to refuse the sort of obedience uh, to the government. The structure of his argument is quite remarkable, even though at first it seems straightforward. After his opening letter in which he describes the theme of the writing as Christian magistracy according to the contents of scriptures, Hubmeier begins the treatise by stating, he will address those scriptures used by the brethren, his, distract, his detractors, those scriptures in which they su see support for a position of total rejection of the sword. There are 16 passages in all. I'll only deal with a few. We might note at the outset that while the argument of most pacifists is based not only on finding support in the words of scripture, they also argue more generally based on discipleship, namely that Jesus nonviolent, uh, Jesus was nonviolent in his actions, and that we are called as disciples to imitate that nonviolent resistance, regardless of what a specific text in scripture might state. Who Meyer thinks otherwise, and I'll highlight his argument with a few examples. In a third passage he addresses, um, he replies that concerning discipleship, we must consider the office and calling of Jesus, which is not the same as the office and calling of those who are ordained now by God to maintain order in society. In other words, Christ's followers are not called to follow the exact office and duties of Jesus, especially if one is to maintain order, something that Jesus, according to Hubmeier, was not called to do. We won't look at this argument in depth now, except to note that already in the first pages, Hubmeier sought to undermine the argument that a Christian's duty in terms of the sword should be based on what Jesus either lived or taught. In general, Hubmeier's treatment of the scripture passages is, of, is that of a skilled interpreter who can dispel the notion that the so-called hard sayings of Jesus are applicable to Christians today. Rather, he'd argue, there are other parts of scripture which provide more sensible guidance for someone who is responsible for order in society today. Soon we'll see how sharply Clemens Adler's response uh, how his approach contrasts with Hubmeier's in this respect. The most remarkable and perhaps startling form Hubmeier's argument takes is where he demonstrates the way scripture itself presents conflicting guidance. In the 12th passage, which he takes uh, Matthew 5, 21, uh, where Christ quotes the commandment, thou shalt not kill, Jesus also adds a further emphasis, a deepening of the commandment. The relationship of the Old to the New Testament arises very clearly here, along with the question of how the whole of Scripture can speak directly to the issue of killing. Budmeier addresses this critical text by shifting his approach and using the argument of scriptural paradox. This is an approach to addressing contradictions in Scripture used also by several other Anabaptists and spiritualists, namely, creating lists of conflicting scriptures to make the point that the main meaning or the plain meaning of scripture cannot be assumed from an individual text. Hubmeier, along with various others, argues that since many passages of scripture appear to contradict others, scripture doesn't address issues directly or clearly enough. So in response to Matthew 5.21, he quotes Romans 13.4, that God in fact did not give the sword in vain, and then asks, how is it possible that killing or not killing should go together as a commandment? And he lists pages and pages um, of verses which, uh, on, on unrelated topics, such as parenting and swearing, um, which present contradictory guidance. And he calls these winged cherubim, and concludes finally that some passages only present half-truths, and the whole truth must be discovered by noting 
the specific context of the passage and its limited application to a certain context or people. This is similar to the medieval argument that certain teachings of Jesus are only applicable to monks who alone are called to follow the counsels of perfection while everyone else has a much lower standard. More generally, Hubmeier argues that the command against killing only applies to killing which is done out of anger, mockery, or despising. While killing which is done to ensure order, which he attests is what the government does, God actually favors to maintain peace among the righteous. When government is justified in its task of killing an evildoer, a Christian is obligated to participate if requested. Not only is one required, but if anyone resists the request, he will receive over himself the eternal judgment of God, in contrast to those who fulfill these duties who are considered servants of God in Scripture, according to whom. God judges, sentences, and kills through them, and not they themselves. From this it follows that those who do not want to kill the evildoer but let them live are acting and sinning against the commandment, you sh thou shalt not kill. For whoever does not protect the righteous kills him and is guilty of his death as much as the one who does not feed the hungry. Hubmeyer is saying here that a Christian is commanded to kill in certain situations, and it's a sin to refuse. Another passage deserves mention to highlight how Hubmeyer's view of the sword is so utterly determined by his belief that the sovereignty of the magistracy as God's ordained rulers, uh, and how he practically mocks the notion of following the example of Christ in non-resistance. In res response to passages from Ephesians and Colossians, which uh, call Christ the head, uh, who, and we, we being his members, Hugmeyer dismisses this argument, uh, saying that we, as followers of Christ, are called to act like him in this regard, um, regarding the sword. Um, uh, in reply, he states, if we look at ourselves, how we are by nature, then Christ is not our head. Also, we are not his members, for he is just and truthful. We are evil and deceitful. And he goes on, adding sarcastically, do you see how the members agree with the head? Then he goes further to argue that if we state that we are members of Christ, or we're guilty of failing to live up to his example, then we need to ask forgiveness for this sin, and we become members not through actions, deeds, ethics, but only through faith. He states, um, not in nature, that is, not in willing and doing as it concerns the flesh, um, which does not want to be subject to the law of God, but in faith, uh, gewalt, is now given to us to become the children of God according to the spirit and the soul. Also, it wills and works good, although all our works according to the flesh are still blameworthy, lazy, worthless, and not at all just before the face of God. Finally, he concludes his argument uh, about this passage by restating the ordained role of government, which he adds, cannot go forth without blood and killing. Therefore, God has hung a sword at the side of the government and not a fox's tail. This final passage he treats is Romans 13, where he makes one more startling argument, which I'll repeat for you here, so that you grasp how uncompromising Hubmeyer was in his advocacy for the right of the state to wield the sword and for Christians to necessarily be involved in roles involving lethal force and are still be, to be considered righteous before God, not only by faith, but in their actions as well. If a Christian could not be a servant of God, could not fulfill the mandate of God without sinning, then God would not be good. He would have made an order which a Christian could not fulfill without sinning. That's a blasphemy. 
Humaya therefore is convinced that Christians need to affirm the sword wielding task of government in general. And if ever asked where to comply with this duty, a Christian need not ask if we're called to act differently than those who are not Christians. And in this way, he comes close to Martin Luther, uh, whose position is that Christians are called to act in a certain way publicly and another way privately, to be Christ-like and, and to suffer in our interpersonal reactions, putting aside all violence. But publicly, we simply allow ourselves to be instruments of the governing authorities whose use of violence and force is commanded by God to maintain order in society. We'll see a very different argument than this developed among various Anabaptists, um, to which we turn now. Before turning to Clements Adler's treaties from 1529, um, I'll note a few key features of the position by this proto hutterite Wolfgang Brandhuber, a follower of Hans Hut and the leader of the Anabaptist community at Linz, Upper Austria, who was executed 1529. In his letter that same year to the Church of God at Rattenberg, he writes to comfort them in the times of trial and admonish them to remain faithful to their calling as followers of Christ, in addition to advocating for a general form of community of goods or economic sharing managed by households, and not in a centralized way. He assured them that the power of the Spirit would guide and strengthen them and caution them about the day of God's wrath in which innocent victims will be spared and avenged. Then Brunt Huber addresses two uses of the sword, capital punishment and self-defense. Addressing the arguments um, such as those made by Hubmeier, he warned not to make Christ into a Moses as some do, who proposed to retain the sword from the law of Moses and oppose the teaching of Christ and his life. They, the sword bearers, Schrettler, argue that a Christian may judge and condemn to death, but that is only for the heathen, those who, as Paul says, are outside of the Gemeinde, outside the fellowship. It refers to 1 Corinthians 5, um, where Paul says, it's no business of mine to judge outsiders. We judge those who are within the fellowship. So instead, Brandhuber argues, um, look to our example, the prince of our faith, our fulfiller, Jesus, who emptied himself of all this, even though all judgment and justice were his. He put it all away and called us to follow him. Rather, the sword of Moses is not to be used by Christians because Moses was still in the shadows and not yet in the light of Christ. We see that Brant Huber appeals to the example of Christ as a basis for ethics. The second matter is expressed in terms of, he calls, self-interested defense and using it on behalf of our government, for which Brandt Huber forbids this use of the sword. He calls this use of the sword simply war, but goes on to state that, um, that also be sure that you don't make the error of vindicating your body as you would be doing this, it, as you would be doing in this case by obeying the government, for this offends God. Although in everything else, except whatever offends God in terms of your body and properties, one should render obedience to the government. We see here how clearly he contradicts Hubmeier, and it also establishes the idea of obeying government only when duties or requirements do not contradict God's commands. Curiously, this idea of obeying God before humans is one Hubmeier also affirmed uh, in an earlier writing, but it didn't translate later into an ethic of nonviolence. For Grant Huber, a Christian does not divide loyalties into private or public, but divides loyalties by priority, first to God, then to Caesar and never in the reverse order. We'll see this position echoed through the Hutterite tradition as it develops its clear statement on the sword and a Christian's duty toward government. We should note again that 
Grant Huber carried with him the expectation of the end times in company with Hunter. In any case, this representation of non-resistance in 1529, the year Brandt Huber would be executed, provides what we could call a fairly clear proto-Hutterite statement in which, which will be repeated and expanded by others. The year 1529 is also so critical as the year when Jacob Hutter and Peter Biedemann were called to ministry and in many respects can be seen as carrying forward the leadership that Brandt Huber carried from Hans Hutt in this transitional period after the deaths of so many key Anabaptist leaders in that region. So before I look, briefly summarizing thus far. From Hutt, we had the idea of a temporary ethic of nonviolence, meaning absolute refusal to obey the government if called to take up the sword. But this doesn't mean he thinks God opposes violence. Rather, a Christian is called to follow Christ in refusing at this point in history to wield the sword. And that is, that is a task being carried out now through the Turks in this era. But when Christ returns, a new era will dawn in which Christians are required to take up the divine task of avenging God's enemies. It's a rather volatile concept or ethic especially in an era when Hutt and others believed the end times were just around the corner. Hubmeier, on the other hand, rejected the idea of a temporary ethic. God's word, the Bible, commanded obedience to government, and if the Bible was read correctly, the task of meeting out justice was forever a divine one in which Christians were required to be instruments even when, or especially when, required when it required the sword to punish the evil and protect the innocent. From the brief writing surviving from Brandt Huber, we see yet a different ethic, which might cohere with Hutz, but which also emphasizes that with Christ, there is a new era in which we now live under different rules than the Jews had under Moses. While the lethal sword was granted under Moses, it has been removed by Christ. Yet Christians are not called to rebel against the government, but to submit. So now we turn finally to Clemens Adler, who will be the focus of the remainder of this lecture. Although this writing, Judgment on the Sword, uh, was never published, it certainly appears to be intended for publication given how carefully and systematically it was constructed. It's arguably one of the clearest, boldest, treaties among early Anabaptists, which supports an ethic of nonviolence and a rejection of Hubmeier's argument. And in fact, I've prepared a full translation of it um, with um, the uh, commentary on Romans 13, which I'll deal with tomorrow morning. Um, and this is one that uh, I'll be publishing in the very near future. I hoped to actually launch it for this series but uh, it's, it's still in the final stages of, uh, of a copy edit and proofreading. Um, but Adler in this treatise did not, as Hubmeier did, develop a list of scriptures. Rather, he developed an overall concept that supported a reading of Christian non-resistance in the Bible as a whole, affirming that all scripture is valid and the word of God while rejecting the arguments that scripture somehow required or allowed Christians to take up the sword. I'll share briefly about his biography. One source described Adler as a learned man who knew three languages perfectly, Latin, Czech, and German. And he was a minister for a long period in Bohemia. He was also active in church reform as early as 1525 in Silesia. Upon joining the Anabaptists, he affiliated with Gabriel Asherham, who we'll deal with in the third lecture, but at some point broke with or was excluded from that group, after which he led a community uh, of Anabaptists in Silesia. A short text in a Hutterite manuscript portrays Adler as a disruptive popular preacher whose arrest motivated peasants to protest. Adler was imprisoned and interrogated, then later released into exile. On, in October of 1533, the Council at Breslau 
informed uh, the Duke, uh, Friedrich of Liegnitz, about Anabaptists who were living under Baron von uh, Bernstein, um, and named a certain Clement, a preacher who was gathering a following. He was eventually martyred by decapitation after being put on trial along with three companions in 1535 or 36. Uh, it's uncertain. His treatise from 1529 was therefore likely written from Silesia since he appears to have remained active there at least until 1533, possibly gathering a flock um, of followers to move to Moravia. So we turn now to the structure of the treaties, which has six sections. It's divided into two parts, um, each with three subsections. Uh, I have a chart here which shows the breakdown um, with part one demonstrating his argument from scripture that all the nations of the world are divided into these three um, peoples or, or categories. Uh, in part two, he deals with the law of Moses broken into commandments, uh, judicial law, by which he means how Jews are to judge matters under the law, uh, and third being ceremonies. And I'll return to these after looking at Adler's discussion of how God provided different expectations and commandments throughout history, respectively to heathens, Jews, and Christians. So part one, Adler uses concepts of eras or figurative 12 hours of history with Christ coming at the 11th hour. He borrowed the concept from medieval Franciscans who developed this as a means to speculate about the end times. The hours began with Adam and Noah appeared in the third hour, Abraham at the sixth hour, and Moses the ninth hour. So if we see this as a clock, it was Noah who came in the first quarter, Abraham finished the second quarter, Moses the third quarter, and since Christ, we are living in the final hour. In other words, the clock isn't any way divided equally into heathens, Jews, and Christians. Rather, heathens ruled for half of human history, but there was development in God's law from Abraham to Moses in these recent eras of history. Even though God ruled over all of human history, God acted in and through all peoples. After the Jews were given a special identity and calling with Abraham, with Moses, they were given the law. In con contrast to the heathen, Jews were held to a more specific code of conduct and had a different relationship with God than the heathen had. In brief, the Jews were not able to complete the hours of history by making God's law manifest for all, but they demonstrated a bodily or physical version, he calls it, and prepared a way for a further spiritual revelation of God. At the 11th hour, Christ called forth the new spiritual kingdom amid all these physical kingdoms, those of the heathen and of the Jews. Now, those who were spiritually part of Christ's new kingdom were required to follow a code or a quote, spiritual law that was different from that of the heathen and also of the Jews. The temporal and physical provisions by God, which were given to the Jews for a certain scope of time and place, were now the forms for developing God's eternal and universal provisions, which were designed to be now for all times and all places. But those who choose to follow Christ are participating in the kingdom now, in time, which Adler says means they will also inherit the future kingdom, the eternal kingdom as well. The hope was for the Jews and all of the nations to become unified in faith and become one people in this spiritual kingdom. The new kingdom is one of peace and justice, as Adler states. Christ's way of spiritual justice. Um, sorry, lost my place. Um, the new kingdom is one of peace and justice. Christ's way of spiritual justice is to exalt those who make themselves humble. And those who exalt themselves are brought down in judgment. He gives those who dwell with him 
peace in the abyss of their heart. And Christ also judges based not only on what is external or physical, but based on the abyss of the heart. As we can see, Adler tries to show how the Bible sets out different guidelines, but also promises, different promises for those who fall under the three categories of heathen, Jews, and Christians. And throughout the 11 hours of history, God has indicated how they are related to the law, whether physical or spiritual. So in part two on commandments, judicial law, and ceremonial law. Adler spends only a couple paragraphs explaining what is indicated in God's commandments. And he spends most of part two explaining issues that follow, fall under judicial law, meaning how judgments are to be made. The final section on ceremonies is five times longer, actually, than the first section on commandments. Um, but that final section is still only half the length of the judicial section, which overwhelms most of part two. Personally, the ceremony section is my favorite because here he deals in very creative, imaginative ways with diverse topics, um, the spiritual dimensions of priesthood, of doctrine, the temple um, in, in a spiritual concept, um, the spiritual Sabbath. Uh, and he ends with a discussion of the application of these spiritual concepts to how God relates differently to heathen Jews and Christians um, uh, and how that developed. Um, and, 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 yeah, he develops these things throughout the whole treatise. Throughout the ceremony section, he also applies the idea of what is given by God in a physical or literal way or through letters. And then how the spirit of God forms something totally different by showing how the physical leads to something deeper. For example, in the case of Sabbath. This was not simply a day of rest from physical work but a spiritual rest from evil. Adler insists that scripture is full of various signs in which God's law was given to prepare humanity for something that would not remain just a literal or physical matter, but would gain in Christ a deeper spiritual meaning which applies or pertains to those who are in Christ. I'll turn now to the brief section on the commandments and then spend the remaining time on what Adler calls judicial law, the task of making judgments. Christians need to obey the, the commandments following Christ's admonition that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. But neither should it conclude that merely following the physical commandments, um, that they, sh rather, they should lead Christians to seek spiritual inner obedience, which matches that outer obedience. He gives three examples of commandments, murder, adultery, and idolatry. Someone who is angry at someone may still observe the law by not murdering, or taking a revenge or acting violently, but that is not enough for Christians. Rather, to obey this inner meaning of the law, one also needs to avoid getting angry in the first place. In this way, he refutes Hubmeyer's denial that there is a conflict between the commandment to kill or not kill, because Adler shows that the command is actually something further, different, which does not conflict uh, with other guidance in scripture. Adler says that following the law in this spiritual way requires one to have the right soil and seeds for true love of their neighbor. In this case, the love of neighbor will not only avoid breaking the commandment, thou shalt not kill, but will also replace the potential feeling of anger with that of love toward others. Loving one's neighbor is the spiritual fulfillment of the commandment, thou shalt not kill. He also gives examples with adultery and idolatry to demonstrate what it means to not simply obey the outer, physical commandment, but also obey the inner, which is what Christ teaches and exemplifies. We start to see here quite clearly what Adler believes is the spiritually based ethic, which is how all Christians, if they are to call themselves Christians at all, are to act.
Now the organization of lengthy section on judicial law has a more complex structure than the others. Uh, in this order, Adler addresses the following topics. The definition of judgment and sentencing, the fellowship or gemeinde and the power of the keys, temporal possessions, oath swearing, and the office of Christ. And in this last section, he includes a discussion in further subsections on uh, the fact that Christ, the means, the means by which he rules um, is through instruction, through working as a shepherd, sacrificing himself as a priest, offering prayers for his enemies and, and for evildoers, and how his burial and ascension also point to his spiritual role as king. The section on judgments and sentencing is broken into capital crimes, uh, those, he says, concerning blood, and those dealing with property. Adler explains his ethic of nonviolence based on the spiritual law found in the New Testament, which first and foremost deals with the issue of hypocrisy. How can someone who is not blameless cast blame on someone else? Or said differently, how can the guilty condemn the guilty? Adler says simply, you will come under God's judgment on account of your judging. But those who must judge should do so, not according to the physical eyes of a human, not according to hearing with physical ears, but according to the truth of the spirit as it abides in you and as it also abides in your hearts. That we, first of all, will each judge our own hearts. But if someone heinously rushes to his neighbor with judgment, he should therefore listen and await a merciless sentence and judgment from God upon himself. Adler then notes the objection that if everyone lives this way, how can there be order and security? His response is as follows. In what way does the world concern you or me, since we are supposed to be and want to be Christians? All Christians should forgive and excuse their neighbor's wrongdoings, as we promise to do when we say, when, when we ask in the Lord's Prayer to forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Adler insists that neither the heathen nor the Jews, nor secular rulers, are commanded by God to obey this injunction, but only Christians, or as he says, true Christians. This means that we're even called to not resist evil because if we forgive someone and then entrust their judgment to God, uh, no, sorry, if we forgive someone, then we entrust their judgment to God and the rulers of the world. Um, for if we still insist on holding others to the letter of the law, then we are being new Jews according to the letters. And we'll need to have a physical circumcision and keep Jewish customs as well. The Jews' obedience to the letter of the law is only a one-sided righteousness, which does not consider the inner sense of the law. Adler uses the images of cracking open a nut and eating the seed. When we get to the seed, the shell is no longer needed. But seeds need to have an outer shell. Laws are like the outer meaning, meaning like the shell, and they have a role, but some people never get to taste the actual nut and never gain a sense of why and how the law is to be kept, which is the spirit of the law. They just focus on the shell. Once again, the Christian's task in using the law is to judge oneself and look into one's own heart. Following the section on capital punishments, before he turns to possessions, Adler explains the special role of the power of the keys as held in a Christian community. This should be of special interest to Hutterites because it provides one perspective on the manner in which internal discipline developed in Moravian and Baptist fellowships. In terms of how the Christian fellowship uses judgment, they are given 
his spiritual sword, which is the word of God, to hack away false teaching, human pretension, and false sects, uh, which are against his word. And the keys to bind and loose are also given in order to admonish and sometimes exclude those who refuse to conform to Christian ordinances, or as we would probably say, uh, Christian ethics. Different from the law of Moses, where stoning was allowed, now only exclusion of the sinner is used, which allows reconciliation and reacceptance if they choose to turn away from sin and admit guilt. Here, the Christian means of judgment differs from the capital punishment given by the heathen and by the Jews. Quite simply, Adler states, a spiritual kingdom cannot wield and therefore use a spiritual sword. Secular kings wield a physical sword. Sorry, did I say it? spiritual? Yeah, physical sword. For their kingdom is also physical. But Christ our king is a spiritual king and also has a spiritual eternal kingdom and therefore his sword must not be physical but spiritual. So Adler's treaties really is a bold concept and argument for non-resistance based on this idea of physical versus spiritual. And I would pause here to ask if we are all convinced by Adler's explanation, dividing the commands into spiritual and physical, is this adequate guidance for us to live as Christians? We can explore these questions um, such as these uh, in the discussion as I'll be interested to hear your reflections on this. Uh, but finally, let's see. Um, on the question of sharing physical possessions or disputing issues that arise between Christians, here Adler is unequivocal. The physical possessions of Christians, physical, are to be held in common and the needs of everyone are to be supplied. However, he doesn't go so far as to explain a common purse uh, as, as developed in the Hutterite tradition, but seems to advocate this more general practice of ensuring uh, that no one suffers, mutual aid, based on Acts 2, more loosely. This also parallels the thinking of Wolfgang Brandt Huber um, that generally outside the congregation, if a Christian is defrauded, they are not permitted to make any claim in court or participate in what he calls heathen justice. Any quarrels inside the congregation are to be dealt with immediately and directly, and compensation should be paid for damages or wrongdoing. So these reflect, obviously, his um, direct reading of guidance in Paul's epistles. But finally, in terms of membership, Adler explains, as a replacement for the secular practice of oath swearing, Christians are baptized as a form of what he calls divine oath swearing. This concludes now my summary of Adler's position on the sword in his lengthy treatise in 1529. I'll ask you the simple question. What do you think of it? Is it convincing? Do you find his explanation cogent for how all of scripture is true if you know whom God is addressing? Can all conflicts between different verses, especially those concerning the use of violence, be resolved by simply saying, God blesses violence for the heathen and in more limited ways for the Jews, but absolutely forbids Christians to use the sword. The issue of judging and punishments concerning life or death or concerning property. Here, does Adler's approach offer anything for us today? Or do we think this approach is in serious need of revision for our day, day and age? So after hearing these four different approaches to God and Gewalt, are we at home with any of these approaches? Or are we hoping that lectures two and three will present something else? And I'd say good news, they will, yes. Um, but lastly, uh, before, before we go into a discussion session, uh, I'll just say in preparation for the next lecture, I would invite you to find uh, at least two different translations of Romans 13 
and to compare them just word for word, uh, especially in the first three verses, three or four verses. Ideally, for those who read German, um, this will also help demonstrate something very fascinating, I find, about these particular verses and how they were read during the early decades of the Reformation. This concludes lecture one. I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for this opening lecture.